All right. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, some some of the work I did on optimization on optimizing optimizing the um, way the, uh, Airflow parses DAGs uh, in Core Airflow. I'm also going to quickly talk about um, how users can uh, not make mistakes that make the DAG parsing longer. But this is not the core of the talk. The core of the talk about uh, how I I did faster. Um, so just a quick slide about me. Um, Okay, uh, I'm uh, I'm French, as you could have um, guessed from my accent, and um, I'm uh, I'm Raphael Vendon. Uh, my pronouns are he and him, and uh, I'm working at uh, AWS. The lo logo should be right there. It's here on my screen. I don't know why it doesn't display here. Um, I'm working at AWS since one year, and uh, my job is to contribute to Airflow uh, full time. So I'm really grateful to Amazon to uh, pay people to do that. Um, so the story I'm going to tell it starts with uh, an ish uh, ticket that was assigned to me, and uh, the ticket was uh, titled "Scheduler Performance Issue," and uh, someone was asking the question like, "They have a DAG, they have a, like 300 DAGs. If they create them in one file, uh, the performance is okay. If they create those 300 DAGs from 300 files, like one file per DAG." Then the scheduler is overwhelmed and uh, like CPU is super high, they cannot do anything with it. And they're asking, why is it the case? Uh, it's a legit question because uh, it's in the end it's the same. Like DAGs are the same, and uh, you could think that maybe like doing loop and rolling, not creating the things in a loop, but doing the loop for the computer would make it faster. It's not the case. Um, if you know how Airflow works internally, uh, you might have a guess why it's the case. Um, at the time, I was quite new on Airflow, so I didn't have a good grasp of what was happening inside. So I didn't really know what was happening. So I just took this ticket and started investigating. And uh, thankfully, because if I had known, maybe I wouldn't have uh, dug as deep and maybe I wouldn't have discovered how to improve this stuff. Um, so what I started doing, I don't have the pictures. <laughs> um, okay. Ah, okay, cool. I don't know what's happening between the screen and my screen. Okay, so what I did is, uh, I, since I didn't know much, I started from the beginning. The beginning is just trying to reproduce the problem and trying to look at it from really from the outside. So I just I used Breeze, uh, which is a way to run uh, to run Airflow locally using Docker. You just uh, type one command and everything is running, and you can put your DAGs in there and see what's happening. It runs in Docker, so I was just looking at Docker, uh, looking at the CPU usage of the container, and I tried to just vary the number of DAGs to confirm there was indeed the, the fact that there was many da uh, many DAGs that was creating the problems. It was not a threshold defect, for example. So I read like 200 DAGs. You can see that the CPU is pretty high. 100, uh, 100 files, uh, you can see it's starting to breathe a bit. And uh, 25 files, everything is fine. Uh, we have plenty of CPU to use to do other stuff. So once I had this, uh, I started digging and uh, reading the code to understand what was happening. Uh, so the parsing time, I could measure the parsing time for every single DAG. There was actually a log. Uh, if you activate this um, configuration setting, it's the um, DAG parser is going to print um, the time it takes to parse every single DAG. So it's very verbose, but very helpful when you debug. And I could see like all the DAGs are pretty much the same. And I could see that it was taking 300 milliseconds per file. Now the DAGs by default are passed every 30 seconds. And there are two processes doing that. So if you do the math, uh, it means that if you have more than 200 DAGs, uh, you cannot go through all of them in, two, in uh, 30 seconds on two processes. You're going to have to, yeah, there are going to be some overlap and the scheduler is going to fall behind, and of course the CPU is going to be high all the time. And uh, by the way, to find those things, so I was reading the code, but I also went to the uh, Airflow config uh, page on the, on, Airflow, on the Airflow website, and I just did a, a search for paths, and I was looking at all the parameters, and this was a good way to see what was the, the parameters that were operating on this. So now I was starting to understand what was happening. Uh, it was just that Airflow couldn't pass the files fine, uh, fast enough. And so even with this, like if you don't know much, you can already propose uh, solutions, like not solutions to fix the problem, but solutions to mitigate it. 
uh, we can act on the configuration we just found. One of the solutions is uh, to just increase the parsing interval. Uh, if Airflow cannot go through all the DAGs in 30 seconds, just give it more time. Uh, another solution is to have more processes. Uh, so if you give it more processes, you'll have more resources to parse the DAGs, of course. Uh, if you do that, so there are drawbacks, like the first drawback and the fine processing interval is that your changes are going to take longer to appear. The drawback of having more processes is that you need a beefier server. If you just give like 10 processes on a server with two cores, it's not going to, to help much. Um, and then, uh, whoop. Yeah, then another solution is to run the DAX processor separately. Uh, the initial problem was the scheduler uh, has a problem, is a performance issue. If you do that, then the DAX processor has a performance issue. But the scheduler doesn't have any performance issues anymore. It can do its scheduler things. Um, so the way you do that, um, you just, when you set this parameter, it tells the scheduler that it should not start a DAG processor, and then you have to start it manually by running this code. So those are solutions that I can already give to the person who opened the tickets uh, to tell them, like, this is how you can get usable airflow uh, today. And now I can start looking at how I'm going to fix the problem. Like, uh, how, how, can I, how can I make it faster? So uh, when Airflow is parsing a DAG, what we mean by parsing is actually it's executing the, the file. It's just running the Python code. So what I can do is I can just go in there and uh, add some of my custom code to time all the lines and uh, see what's, what's taking so long, like what's taking 300 milliseconds to run this Python file. So if you take a look at it, um, maybe you have an idea what is going on. Um, can you take a guess at what is slow in this file? So yes, the, some people say the variables. So indeed, the variables uh, are something that is not recommended. It can be slow. But here, in this case, it was not that slow. It was not taking very long. What was taking long is I tricked you. It's not on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> There was the import. Um, so the imports are pretty basic. It's just also like import blank tasks and then sensor variable. There is nothing crazy going on here, but when I was timing it, uh, like out of the 300 milliseconds, we were spending like more than 200 milliseconds on the imports. So I thought, well, this is very weird. Like how I can Python run? Because I was new to Airflow, I was new to Python as well. <laughs> so I was like, how can Python run uh, stuff efficiently if it takes so long to pass the, the imports every single time? So I read a bit about what was happening, and what is happening is that in Airflow, we... It's okay. What is happening is that in Airflow, uh, when you pass a DAG, a DAG is just, it's a user code. So you don't want user code messing with your core Airflow code. There can be anything in the DAG. You don't want to be able to crash Airflow. So what we do is to isolate that. The process is started just to pass the DAG. Uh, it works on a copy of the memory of the main process. And when it's done, it's just destroyed. So what's happening is that you create the process. You do all the imports. They are stored. They are put in the cache, like we usually do in Python, so that we can reuse them later. And then when we're done with the DAG, we just trash the process with the memory. And you lose all the work you did on the imports. So because of this, the imports are never processed in the main thread. They are never in the main memory. And so they, we have to process them every time, which is taking a long time. And software optimization is often uh, identifying what is, what is repeated and then finding a way to do it only once. Uh, we found what was repeated. Now we just have to find a way to do it only once. So the solutions that we're thinking about was uh, first, maybe you could think about uh, communication, communicating between the processes. But if we do that, it's pretty complex. There are many independent processes that keep on being created and destroyed. It's really hard to do. So uh, didn't investigate this way. Uh, maybe we could also stop using one process per DAG, but then we lose the um, isolation that we really need, that we uh, cannot do without. So really not a good option. And then the last option was to uh, do the import in the main thread before forking. So we cannot do all the imports because some of the imports are gonna be dependencies of the users. 
that are going to conflict with uh, what is what we are importing in Airflow. And also, like if you just do doing all the imports, it's user code again. But there is a set of, of imports that we know the users are going to import very often. And also we know and what they are going to do is the imports of Airflow. Everyone is going to import like uh, operator sensors, uh, annotations, uh, DAG, stuff like this. So this we can pre-process for them and it should be a, a good gain for many DAGs. Um, so I did a bug with this. Uh, what we do is that we, what I did is um, I just pass the file, I just do the, uh, the, tokeniz the tokenization. So I don't run the, the Python or anything. It's pretty fast. You just read the file and you separate it into, into tokens. I didn't write the code myself. I just use the Nubos library that does that. And then I just look at the imports. And uh, if it starts with Airflow, I import that. Using that, uh, I did some uh, uh, metrics. Tried to look at uh, some, did some benchmarks. And I could see that uh, it was 22% faster uh, if I was pre importing uh, the, the Airflow imports. Which was nice, but I was a bit surprised because when I looked at the file first, it was taking a really long time. So I was expecting something better. So there was a catch. Uh, I timed the file again after doing that. And if we look at the, the code one more time, uh, there is an import at the top. Uh, this one, it's actually an obsolete import. Uh, it's from like airflow.sensors. Now they have been moved to airflow.providers.aws or something. And so there is some code in there that is like intercepting the import and importing something else instead. Instead, and this prevents this from being cached. So if I replace this with the actual import, like the new one, uh, what I can see is that if I run the benchmark again, I can see a fifty-nine percent gain on the on the time it takes to pass the DAGs, which is a lot more impressive, and that was very satisfying to me. Um, now I was just running this on the files that I had um, given from a user. So just like one type of DAG, it's not super representative of um, what users would do in the, in the field. So what I did is I, I took some example DAGs, uh, which are just like examples that people write when they write operators. And so they, I could get a more diverse uh, set of DAGs and a more representative uh, performance uh, improvements. And we get a wide range of improvements from minus 20, uh, from 25 percent faster to 70 percent faster, which is um, the range is pretty wide, but overall it's, it's very good. Um, it's it's going to depend, of course, on how complex your DAG is, and it's also going to depend on like how many imports you have, for example, that are not airflow imports and that we cannot preprocess. So this is uh, very nice, but then I was investigating a bit more on the issue. And uh, about this usage of variables, when I told you that this was not very long, um, actually you were right, because uh, I was running in Breeze, and when you run in Breeze, you have everything that's local. Uh, you have, like, the DB is local as well. So it's pretty fast, but as long as, as soon as you have a DB that's distant, or even worse, if you run, um, like, AWS Secret Manager, which is going to do network calls to AWS every time you do a secret lookup, it's, it gets a lot slower. Like we got to 800 milliseconds per DAG as soon as I enabled AWS Secret Manager. And uh, if like if with my previous optimization, I could get it down to like 600 milliseconds maybe, which is still very bad. So I was thinking like, what should I do with it? Um, and I talked a bit with the community, and uh, the answer was just don't do it. Don't use the variables. <laughs> And then you then, then your DAG is faster. So it's a bad practice. Uh, the documentation is pretty clear about it. They say that you shouldn't do it. Uh, but the thing is that users do it anyway. So we cannot go to the user and hit them with a stick until they stop doing it, <laughs> even if, if it's written. So what should we do about it? Uh, what we should do is, even though it's not recommended, we can do whatever we can to make it as fast as possible. In, not as bad as uh, it is right now. So what I thought about it was, um, let's add a cache. It solves everything, right? Uh, no, it doesn't. <laughs> there is a many problem with caching. Uh, cache invalidation, for example, is a big problem. Like, when do you decide that you need to refresh your cache? 
Uh, also, for example, different uh, processes can have a different state in their cache, and then the behavior might be inconsistent. Uh, it also delays the time it takes for updates to appear. Uh, but also, it's still very efficient. It's efficient at uh, saving time. It's efficient at saving money as well, because whenever you query an external service, uh, you might be charged for the API calls that you do. It's the case for the Secret Manager on AWS, but also for GCP for Azure. Like all, all three pro uh, cloud providers charge per API call. So it can be some pretty expensive uh, cloud bills. So adding a cache was a good solution. And there was a lot of discussion in the, in the community on whether we actually wanted to do that, because it was kind of encouraging a bad practice and also because of all the, ca the, the catches I just talked about. Uh, but the conclusion was yes. So we now have an optional cache on variables. It's off by default. Um, Mark was talking about it this morning in, in his talk. Um, this is the, the configuration to enable it. Uh, and just on the technical side, it uses Python multiprocessing manager. So since the DAGs are in different processes, we cannot uh, like they can share a dictionary that's here before, but if they write to it, they're going to write in their own memory, not in shared memory. So the multiprocessing manager is something that's in core Python. It's super cool. It spawns a different process that's only going to manage the dictionary. And then uh, every call you make to the dictionary is transparently sent to this process. And the process sends back, like if you say, give me this key, it's going to send back the key. So it's a nice way to do it. There are some caveats, like what I just talked about before, uh, especially if you use uh, configure like variables to decide, for example, how many tasks there are, there's going to be in your DAG. Uh, you might have some bad surprises because when you change the configuration, uh, and if you have two schedulers, for example, they won't have the same status at the same time, and you, your DAG might be flipping back and forth <laughs> uh, during the time the, the two caches are not in the same state. And uh, I'm not going to show you any metric, any benchmarks, because uh, I can make the benchmarks as good as I, as good as I want. I can just write a DAG that has like 1 million variable calls, and uh, it's going to improve by 99%. But uh, it can help a lot if your DAG has uh, variable calls. It's also uh, including connections, um, because like connections are actually secrets. So whenever you do like AWS connection ID, for example, it's actually a query on the secret. Uh, it's on, only during parsing, um, so it, not on when the deck is actually running on the on the walker, because then we want fresh data. And uh, also, it's experimental, so it's a, a feature that you should use with care. And the conclusion of my talk is that uh, you don't have to be an expert to have an impact on something. You just by digging down and looking at the code and, and the metrics and trying to understand what is happening, um, you can have in a, some, do something cool. Uh, you just need time and motivation uh, to investigate. I know that uh, it's not easy for everyone, especially the, the time <laughs> component, because I'm paid to contribute to Airflow, so I can do that. And, uh, but not everyone can do that on their, on their personal time. Um, but yeah, if you have time and motivation, you can achieve stuff. And that's it. <laughs>